Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your love. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for calling us to be lights, to giving us your light that we can share. May we be willing to shine brightly for you is my prayer in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. Think for a minute, what is the most valuable thing you have ever lost? Maybe it was your driver's license or your passport. Maybe it was your watch. Maybe it was your wallet or your purse. What a hassle that can be. But I'm wondering if anyone has ever lost anything that looks like what you're about to see on the screen. Anybody ever lost something like this? This, in case you're wondering, is our youngest daughter, Amanda. And um, I think in that picture, maybe she's two or three. The next picture shows her a little older. <clears throat> Could there be a cuter little girl? Don't, don't be asking me that question. This was uh, taken on the shore in New Jersey. They don't call it the beach. They call it the shore. So uh, if you want to fit in in New Jersey, don't ever say we're going to the beach. This was at the shore. And then the final picture is, I believe, her first day. School. Now she's married. And they just moved into their first house. And they're way down in California. And I miss her. But about 25 years ago, more or less, there was a sunny day in the summer my brother, David, who at the time lived in Maryland, and I decided we wanted to take the kids to an amusement park, something like Six Flags or Disneyland. New Jersey had its own version. And we would do this so that the, the ladies, the, the two wives, good friends, they were good friends, Flo and Sandy, would be able to go and shop for the day. This was many years ago, you understand, when, um, when I was still a little bit naive about that. Go ahead and shop for the day. <clears throat> and so we uh, decided to take the kids. We went to the park. Before, I still remember, before we left with the children, my wife very pointedly said to me, now watch the kids. And I said, oh, of course I'm going to watch the kids. Why wouldn't I watch the kids? No, no, she said, you don't understand. There's going to be thousands of people. The children are small, but especially keep your eye on Amanda. She's got a mind of her own. Even though she's only five years old, you've got to watch her like a hawk. I said, I'm a hawk. And so they left, and we left. It was a great day, a good sunny day. It was a lot of fun to be with the family. And the first ride we took was on the gondola. We went all the way across. You know how you can go across the, the grounds. We did that. It was exhilarating. We got off of that. We were walking across the street to the, the log ride. You know, the logs on the, uh, on the water come down. We saw the splashing. You know, my, my gaze was fastened on how much fun it was going to be to get in a log and ride down that, that, long, that long ride down to the bottom and that, that huge splash. And I looked around, and Amanda was gone. 
and my heart dropped. You can only imagine it if it's happened to you. And maybe it's happened. Maybe you've been in a department store and one of your kids suddenly is, is not there and you know that feeling that hits you in the pit of your stomach. And, it, and it, it turns your face white and it just makes you sick. And so I began to run. I went back to the gondola ride. I thought maybe she had turned around and went back there. She wasn't there. I came back and by now the, the crowds were just pouring down this street. And I looked up and down and no, no, no girl, no Amanda. There were, there were some dumpsters. I ran and looked around behind the dumpsters. I looked in the dumpsters. No Amanda. My heart was racing. I was in full panic attack. And finally, I, I saw a security officer, and I, I stopped him, and I said, I've lost, I've lost my girl. And immediately, got on his walkie-talkie. They closed they closed the gates. And we began an all-out search. We had to find that little girl. I was thinking of how in the world I was going to explain to Flo that I had lost her baby. How do you explain that? You say, well, you have two older kids. Would that work? I don't think so. We could have more kids. No. We had to find Amanda. And all I could think about, and you know how, how your mind goes as a parent when something like this happens, you think about the worst. You think about kidnapping. You think about Amber Alerts. They never had Amber Alerts back then. Uh, but uh, that's what I was thinking of, uh, some kind of kidnapping. In fact, there recently had been a case where uh, some guy had snatched a, a little girl taken her into the restroom, cut her hair, changed her clothes, made her look like a little boy. That's all I could think about. So the security guard could see my, my predicament and said, well, we're, we're doing all we can out here. Go to the security office. And, uh, and check down there. If we find her, we'll bring her there. So I went. I went running to the security office, hoping, praying. You talk about praying. Lord, please. I made a lot of promises to the Lord in those few minutes. And I rushed to that building. I opened the door wide. And there she was. Standing there in front of the desk. Talking to one of the security officers. Just like nothing had happened. And I was so happy to see her. I rushed in. I think I scared her a little bit with my enthusiasm as I grabbed her and held her, probably in a grip that she thought I would crush her. I never wanted to let her go. Lost and found. I'm thankful that she was found. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus tells three stories. There's three parables about things that were lost and found. And it's interesting to me that there's nowhere else in all of the Bible that he ever does this. There's no place else where he ever tells three parables, one right after the other, to make a point. You won't find them anywhere. And so what I'm thinking is, there must be something important about what he's saying here. There's a message that he wants us to get. So I would like to invite you to focus your attention for the next few minutes on Luke chapter 15. 
And you know these stories. They're familiar to us. The first one has to do with the lost sheep. <clears throat> and uh, you heard a little bit about that already in our scripture reading. Luke chapter 15. <clears throat> and it starts there, the, the prodigal, or the, uh, the lost sheep starts with verse 4. But really to understand what Jesus is saying here and who he's talking to and the point that he's trying to make, you have to read verses 1 through 3. It's always good to read the context of any passage. And so here's what was happening. It says, Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. Who's the him? It's Jesus. That's right. And the Pharisees and the scribes, those are the church leaders, right? Right? They complain, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Now, were they saying this in a gracious manner? Were they saying, Isn't it nice that Jesus is meeting with the publicans and the sinners? Isn't it nice that he is spending time with the riffraff? Of course not. They were saying, What's the matter with this Jesus? He claims to be the Messiah. He claims to be sent from God. Doesn't he know that God doesn't have time for these kind of people? Doesn't he know that these kind of people that are down and out, these kind of people that are drunks and drug addicts, the, the dregs of society, doesn't he know that they're being punished for their sins? That God doesn't want them. God doesn't have time for them. So Jesus hearing what they were saying, knowing what they were saying, decides he's got to speak to them. He's got to make a point here. And you'll notice how he does it. He doesn't come right out and tell them what terrible church leaders they are. He doesn't rail against them publicly or embarrass them. This is what I love about how Jesus works with people. He tells them, he gives them something to think about, he gives them three stories here, and he's hoping and praying that somehow the Holy Spirit will, will put this message, the real message of what he's saying, into their hearts. He starts by talking about the sheep, the hundred sheep. Shepherd loses one of them. Is he happy to have ninety and nine? Does he go into his, his house and sit down and have a hot drink by the fireplace because he's got almost everybody there? Of course not. He goes out and he searches. <clears throat> he goes out in the night. It says, for the one that is lost. Into the wilderness he goes until he's found it. And then he brings that lost sheep home. And what does he do? Does he drive it in front of him? Does he put a leash on it and drag it home? Where does he put it? On his shoulders. He carries that lost sheep home. Then there's a woman who lost a coin, very valuable coin, one of ten silver coins. And she takes a lamp, she sweeps the house, she searches carefully until she finds it. And when she's found it, she says to her neighbors and friends, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say there is great joy in heaven in the presence of the angel of God over one sinner. Same thing happened with the, with the sheep, right? Rejoice with me. Calls his neighbors, calls his friends. Again, likewise in heaven there is great rejoicing. And then, of course, the parable of the lost son. young man gets it in his head that he's tired of the rules and regulations of home. He goes to his father. He asks for the inheritance, which was really illegal. It wasn't legal to do this because by law, this wasn't done until the death of the father. And so basically what the young son was saying is, hey, dad, you're getting old, but 
You know, you're still in pretty good shape, and uh, you're probably going to live for a long time. I don't want to wait till I'm old to enjoy my inheritance. Give it to me now. And his father had every right to deny him that request, but his father said, okay. And so he leaves with a bag full of gold, and you know, he finds friends. It's easy to find friends when you have gold in your pocket, right? Right? But pretty soon the gold runs out, and when the gold ran out, the friends ran out. There was a famine in the land. He couldn't even find food to eat. He hires on with a farmer to feed his pigs, and he's a Jew. Can't get much lower than that. And the Bible says, thankfully, that he came to himself. And he said, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to ask for my father's forgiveness, and I'm going to tell him I'm not worthy to be your son. Just, just let me be a servant. That's fine. And you know his father was watching and waiting for him. Threw his robe around him. Put his signet ring on his hand. Said, lo, this is my son. He was lost. And now he's found. And he calls the servants in and he said, let us rejoice. Go out. Get the fatted calf. We're having a feast. What a day of rejoicing. It was just like the rejoicing in heaven over one who comes home. Now, in these uh, three parables, there are some differences and there's some similarities. Each one of these parables represents a different class of people, a different type of sinner. The lost sheep represents those who know they are lost but cannot come home by themselves. They need help. And the Bible says they've wandered far away, haven't they? They're out in the wilderness. They're far from the fold. And they're in bad shape. And if nobody goes and helps them, they'll perish. They can't come back. The lost coin represents those who are also lost, but they don't know their true condition. They don't know just how bad off they are. They're okay with where they're at, and yet the Bible says, and Jesus says, that God still loves them even though they don't recognize their need. They don't know about him. They don't know that he's really the one that they need. He still wants to save them even though they're okay in their condition. And even though sin has taken a toll on them, just like that silver coin, you know, was on the, on the dirty floor of that, of that little house. And those, those houses, by the way, if, you, if you've seen some of them, they're kind of dark and uh, they're not real clean. So it's not hard to imagine that silver coin uh, falling onto the, Dirt, probably dirt floor, being covered with dust. But underneath the dust, was the silver coin still silver? You bet it was. And the woman of the house knew it was still silver, and she went and looked for it until she found it. And even though there are many who don't profess a need for him, God says, you're still important to me. You're still valuable. You're still silver. And I still want you. And of course, the, the son who, who left, he, um, he was a rebellious character, wasn't he? he? He made a decision to walk away. And it's interesting, the father didn't go after him in that case. There were some lessons he needed to learn. But the father never gave up hope. The father never gave up looking, did he? He was always on the porch. He was always waiting for that lost son to come home. And when he first saw him, the Bible says he ran to him. He ran to him. This is, this is quite a picture of, 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 a, of a mature, older Jewish man with his robes, you know. You, you know how, um, how sometimes if you've got a, you ladies, you know, if you have a dress on or a skirt on, how, how do you run? 
Well, you, you, you got to pull it up a little, right? You, gotta, you, you, you can't run. So I see this guy, this, this, this father, this man, he's, he's got a hold of his robe up above his knees so he can at least run. And he's running down the road after his son. And it didn't matter that he stunk like the pigsty. His son was coming home. How do we welcome people who come home? What kind of a reception do they get when they still smell, when they're still dirty? So there are some differences, but there are also some similarities in these stories. First of all, in each story, something of great value was lost, wasn't it? There was something very important that was lost. And it was so important and so valuable that a search was made for that lost coin, that lost sheep. And finally, what was the third thing that these stories have in common? What was the third thing? Think about it. They were all found there. So the, the hope, there's, there's hope in these stories, right? No matter what kind of sinner we're talking about, God wants them, and if we seek them, and we'll find, we can find them and bring them home. There's hope, yes. What else happened that these things have in common? After there was great rejoicing in heaven. Well, there was rejoicing on earth too. But the Bible says the angels rejoice on, on the earth. They, they were calling their, their neighbors and their friends and their relatives, come on over, we're having a party. The one who was lost has been found. Rejoice with me. I wonder what the angels do in heaven when they rejoice. Wouldn't you be curious to know? Great rejoicing in heaven. Singing. Dancing. Clapping. I don't know what they do. But they're, they're, they're excited up there and they're doing all they can in every way they can to show their joy, to show their excitement, to show their enthusiasm for what's happened. I'm wondering this morning, how are we doing with those who are lost? You know, it, it says that the sheep was in a far, you know, wandering in the far wilderness. But the coin was close to home, right? The, clo the coin was right in the house. So where, where, where does our first work begin? Parents? It starts at home, that's right. We don't have to be missionaries in a foreign field to work for the Lord. We've got a family to work for. We've got loved ones to, to help see the love of Jesus and show them the way. And, um, and I'm glad that that little woman kept sweeping and looking until she found the coin. And I'm, I'm, I'm hoping and I'm, I'm hopeful because I know I'm still praying for some of my loved ones. I know many of you are praying for your loved ones. Let's never give up on them. What do you say? Let's never stop praying. Never stop hoping. Sometimes it's easy for us to get caught up in the things of this life. We're all busy. It's sometimes hard to really feel feel for the lost. I, I'm, I'm saying this personally as well. We, we drive down the highway, we, we drive by the houses on our, on our street, and you know, we really don't know the condition of the people around us. How, how, do, we, how do we get this, this same kind of passion that Jesus had and he was, he was giving us a picture of God, right, when he was here? And he was saying, just as the Father has sent me, so send I you, right? We're, we're to be now the eyes, the hands, the feet of Jesus. So how do we, how do we get that, 
that passion for, for those who are lost, whether it's in our families or outside that family circle. How do we do that? I want to share a quote with you uh, before we have our, our closing song. It's from the book Christ's Object Lessons. You may have heard of it. And um, it's going to be on the screen here in just a minute. There is a way. There is a way that the Lord's servant has said that we can rekindle that, that flame, rekindle that fire for other people. That we can have that same passion that Jesus had when he was here. That we can value a soul no matter its condition, no matter its shape or size or color or economic background. I, I still remember that song I used to sing when I was in kindergarten. Jesus loves the little children. Remember that? All the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Yeah. They're all precious in his sight. How precious are they in our sight? How concerned are we, are we about their salvation? And here's what she says. Would you read it with me? Let's read it together. The value of a soul... Who can estimate? Would you know its worth? Go to Gethsemane and there watch with Christ through those hours of anguish when he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. Look upon the Savior uplifted on the cross. Hear that despairing cry, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Look upon the wounded head, the pierced side, the marred feet. Remember that Christ risked all for our redemption. Heaven itself was imperiled. At the foot of the cross, remembering that for one sinner, Christ would have laid down his life, you may estimate the value of a soul. Where will we where will we see the value? At the cross. At the price. As we, as we understand, as we more fully grasp the price that was paid, then the value of each of those souls that are out there, whether they're close to us or a little farther away, their value goes up. And we will seek for them as Jesus seeks for us. shelter of the fold but one was out on the hills away far far from the gates of gold away on the mountains wild and bare away from the tender shepherd's care, away from the tender shepherd's care. Lord, thou hast here thy ninety and nine, are they not enough for thee? But the shepherd made answer, one of mine has wandered away from me. And although the road be rough and steep, I go to the desert to find my sheep. I go to the desert to find my sheep. 
But none of the ransomed ever knew How deep were the waters crossed Nor how dark was the night That the Lord passed through Ere he found his sheep that was lost Far out in the desert he heard its cry Fainting and helpless and ready to die. Fainting and helpless and ready to die. Lord, whence are these blood drops all the way that mark out the mountain's track? They were shed for one who had gone astray ere the shepherd could bring him back. Lord, why are thy hands so rent and torn? They are pierced tonight by many a thorn. They are pierced tonight by many a thorn. But although the mountains thunder riven and up from the rocky steep, there rose a cry to the gates of heaven, Rejoice, I have found my sheep. And the angel sang around the throne, Rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own. Rejoice, for the Lord brings back his own. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we, we can't even begin to imagine the kind of love that brought our shepherd from heaven to this dark earth. Talk about a journey. But he came, and he would have come for just one. And that one was me. Thank you for coming. Thank you for suffering. Thank you for the hands and the feet that bled. Thank you for the life that was given. And now, Lord, we, as your followers, have been commissioned, have been sent. May we faithfully follow the example of the great shepherd is my prayer in his name. Amen.